Live from Santa Clara, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Cloud Foundry Summit 2017. Brought to you by the Cloud Foundry Foundation and Pivotal. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host John Troyer. Happy to welcome back to the program a multi-time <laughs> guest, uh, Stephen O'Grady who is principal analyst and co-founder of Red Monk. That's right. Uh, very good to see you. That's my pleasure. Uh, yeah, we said th those of us, uh, you know, in the, uh, the the Boston area, we have to come cross country to be able to talk sometimes. It's quite the flight. Um, so, you know, you at Red Monk, obviously heavily involved with the developer community. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been at this show a number of times. What, what's the vibe? What what are some of the kind of big themes uh, that, that that you've been seeing at the show, and any big changes from previous years? Um, I, I think the biggest change, or probably the biggest uh, theme that I see this year, is that it's uh, more of a developer focus uh, than we've seen in the past. So at Redmonk, you know, we use the term developer, but we use that term loosely. It can refer to a variety of practitioners, right? In some cases it might be op staff, in other cases it might be you know, people administering a database, in other cases it might be you know, sort of people actually writing code. And certainly I think from a theme perspective and from an attendance perspective, you know, a lot of the people that I've talked to here um, are, you know, a lot of them still have their hand in ops, uh, certainly, but you know, we're seeing a lot of development uh, attention here. One of the things we've looked at is, you know, Cloud Foundry in general and Pivotal specifically, yeah. sell to a lot of big enterprises. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not, you know, I, I'm sure there are cases, but most of the people we've been talking to, I mean, you know, big insurance companies, sure. uh, Express Scripts, uh, you know, things like that. This is not, oh, you know, small group of developers that are just tinkering and doing some startup, but sure. big companies with lots of apps. Mm -hmm. um, how does that fit into your, your view of uh, you know, where, where, where things happen and how transformation happens? Um, honestly, I think you know, there's a couple things that are going on, uh, you know, in particular with respect to developers. You know, basically, the thing that we hear from the enterprises all the time is, is that we want to give developers the opportunity to be productive and focus on the things that they care about. Right? So it's not, you know, in other words, this isn't like, um, for example, a new programming language that enters the enterprise because somebody says, oh my God, I love this new programming language and that's what I'm going to do. Um, but you know, a lot of the driver here, you know, from at least from the enterprises that we talk to, right, is about making developers' lives easier um, and simpler. And I think beyond that, you know, really when we when we start to look at um, you know the adoption and sort of where it's going, where it sits in the marketplace, you know, it's you know I think very, I think it's very consistent, you know, with what we would expect, you know, which are you know, for example, environments that are. Um, you know, tend to remove some of the operational concerns. So, all right, you know what? What I really want to do is, you know, build an application. I don't want to necessarily worry about everything that goes into that. You know, everything that has to sort of go on to make that happen and be deployed and be kept healthy. Um, and you know, just as importantly, I want this to be done in a way that allows me to work the way that I want. So, not single language, not tied to a particular platform that allows me to kind of go wherever I want. So. Yeah, I think in terms of the adoption that we see, you're right. You know, there's a lot of enterprise traction, um, big, you know, sort of traditional businesses, but it's very much, um, like I said, it's consistent with certainly what we expect from the marketplace. A lot of times, the the analyst coverage or the press coverage gets framed in terms of the horse race: mm -hmm. who's winning, who's losing, yeah, of course. what's hot, hype cycle. Yep. And um, I don't know if that's always particularly productive and we're probably not in a winner takes all sort of even scenario. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a better way of, of looking at this or how, how could, should we be looking at platforms and Yeah, I think the, you know, I, I think it's true, like everybody wants to turn it into some zero or some equation and more importantly they want to reduce it to a, usually A versus B, right? They want a simple binary comparison. Um, I think the way that we look at it is, is that, you know, when I, like years and years and years ago, uh, when, you know, I was a systems integrator, your choices were pretty minimal, right? There's only one real, like, I shouldn't say one approach. You basically were going to choose between Java, typically, or, you know, the Microsoft stack. Um, assuming that you were not a Microsoft shop, you go the Java route, there was basically one way you built applications. It was, you know, sort of three-tier architectures, you know, app server, you know, relational database, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that doesn't look anything like the world that we see today. You know, what we see today is much more of a, um, I guess the best way to put it would be sort of different tools for different jobs. Uh, and, you know, it is at virtually every layer, um, you know, from database, you know, sort of on up to platform to, uh, you know, tooling, you know, anything that goes into it. You know, frameworks, languages, take your pick. Uh, you're going to have more choices, you're going to have more diversity, you know, certainly than we did 10, 15 years ago. And as a result, you know, it becomes, you know, again, like I said, just sort of a different tool for different jobs as opposed to, 
this is a zero sum equation and you know sort of one of these players is going to take all the market because look they take different approaches um, you know there's a reason that you have more than one choice and that's you know typically because you know like I might prioritize this you might prioritize that in which case okay I'm going to pick a different tool than you right, right but people yeah people in the e e ecosystem using that tool actually very productive very happy uh, for this whole generation yeah very much I mean but so speaking of different Different ecosystems, big news in at this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about Project Kubo, mm -hmm. yep. uh, bringing Kubernetes on top of on top of Bosch yep. uh, with some of the same tooling, but you know, being able to install, manage, upgrade. Mm -hmm. How should people be thinking about uh, now the introduction of Kubernetes into the Cloud Foundry platform? Honestly, I think it's <clears throat> I think again it's, it's very consistent with what we just talked about: different tools for different jobs. Right? You know, so in other words. Um, you do have people who want to operate at an elemental level with containers, uh, and that is sort of their base building block, that's really the only thing that they care about, um, in which case, that's great. You know, Kubernetes is a very solid, you know, sort of option for you, and having the ability to leverage, you know, some of these, these same um, underlying componentry as a project like Cloud Foundry, which tends to be more app-centric, right? I'm not thinking necessarily in containers, I have an app, and I want to let Cloud Foundry sort of do all the heavy lifting and worrying about, you know, hey, what are these containers? Um, so, you know, to me it's, I think it's a welcome development. So rather than forcing customers into a, you know, sort of particular choice and trying to remove choices from them, it's basically saying, look, if this is, you know, sort of your prioritization, if this is how you look at the world, great, you know, go Kubo. Um, you know, we still have, you know, obviously, you know, sort of a different approach and a different tool for a different job uh, in Cloud Foundry. You know, so I think it's, you know, from my perspective, again, I'm not a member of, any one of these communities, but from the perspective of an analyst, um, it's the kind of thing where you know you want to support that kind of choice for customers. How are customers dealing with the paradox of choice? Uh, you know, <laughs> one of the things you look at is, isn't it much easier if I just choose a platform? It's totally opinionated. It'll help you know simplify my environment. I mean, Cloud Foundry in some ways is you know opinionated. Yeah. Um, but you know, we keep talking about you know there's choices, there's options. Yep. Uh, the SAP keynote yesterday put up this really complicated stack drawing, sure. and uh, he, when he said I'm going to walk through it, the entire audience cracked up a lot. So yeah. we know this isn't. Easy stuff. No. So, how do customers sort through all that, make the right decisions? You know, stay flexible and yet agile. It's you hard, know? honestly, you know? and, and uh, I don't want to give my keynote tomorrow away. <laughs> um, but that'll be a big, you know, sort of uh, topic of it. But basically, the, the, the gist of it is essentially that um, uh, choice to me is, is kind of like a, uh, a parabola, right? So, in other words, if you have no choice, that's a bad thing. The more choice, you know, you have a say, you have you know one choice, two choices, three choices. You know, that goes up. You know, from a um, uh, utility and a value standpoint, but you know there, it begins to go down, right? You begin to see diminishing and, um, in fact, negative returns, because if all of a sudden I'm going from, hey, I have to pick between two or three options to two or three projects, to picking between ten and twenty, you know, that quickly it just doesn't scale. And you know, particularly these days, as we were talking about earlier, it's not just that I have to do that in one category; I have to do that in every category, right? So take databases. It used to be, this is one of the examples I'll talk about tomorrow. It used to be. There were no other databases. I mean, there were, but you know, 99% of the time it was going to be a relational database. So the choice of what style of database didn't exist. And even within that, you had you know two or three commercial options that took the bulk of the market share. So that's not a particularly complicated choice. You look at the market today, quite a bit more complicated. So yeah, in a perfect world, you know, certainly from the CIO's perspective, do they want to standardize on you know single platform, single approach, single language, single database, et cetera? Sure, they do, um, but I think what we're seeing from a marketplace standpoint is essentially, a, you know, companies I think are striving to get to a happy medium, where it's okay. You know, we want, you know, certainly more choice than just the single platform, one size fits all. This is the solution to all known problems, but we also don't want to go down the, you know, sort of paradox of choice, which is, you know, hey, I'm picking between half a dozen projects in eight different categories, and now I have to figure out how to wire all that stuff together. So in other words, you know, going back to what we were just talking about, you know, if you go to a customer and say, look, you know, if you're app-centric, great, there's Cloud Foundry. If you are uh, you know, container-centric, you know, there's Kubernetes, and by the way, they're running the same um, infrastructure, that's not bad, right? You're basically trying to come at it you know, from a, you're trying to provide choice, but choice in a sort of manageable, um, uh, sort of bite-sized fashion, you know, as opposed to, you know, hey, here are 50 different projects that you have to sort through. 
What about the discussion of really the multi-cloud world? Mm -hmm. uh, how do customers figure out whether they just use you know, simple infrastructure as a service or go deeper uh, into you know, services that are, I, I guess you'd say, a little bit more proprietary, mm -hmm. therefore it's a little bit more sticky, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, makes it difficult to change, seems to be kind of a fundamental challenge for something like Cloud Foundry to, sure. to play into that type of environment. Yeah, it's a good question, you know, and I think the first step, honestly, for many enterprises is to acknowledge the fact that they're running in clouds, you know, because we still go out and talk to, <laughs> to uh, you know, a variety of different businesses, right, and we'll say, you know, hey, you know, what cloud, you know, sort of uh, platforms are you using now? And they'll say, oh, we're not using any of that. I'm like, yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, you, just, yeah. you don't know when, that yet. When I, when I go speak at conferences, it's like, you know, there's two types of people out there, people that know that they're using Amazon and the people that haven't figured out that That's somebody right. was using That's Amazon. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think, like I said, I think step one for most of them is to, essentially to get a handle on, okay, what are we actually using? Um, step two is, you know, trying to rationalize and sort of have a, a strategy in terms of, okay, what are we using, how are we using it, and how do we diversify our bets? Because, you know, for a lot of very good reasons, um, you know, enterprises are reluctant to put all of their eggs in one basket, you know, from a platform standpoint. Which means, okay, you're probably going to use more than one cloud. Um, even if the bulk of your work is on uh, Amazon or any other provider, you probably want somebody else to keep them honest uh, and to essentially hedge your bets, you know, about future price increases or, you know, decreased levels of service, whatever it might be. Uh, to enable that, however, you do need essentially layers of, uh, essentially insulation from proprietary services, right? And that traditionally, you know, people forget this now, but we go back to you know, the Java middleware market, that was the purpose of Java middleware, right? All of a sudden I had a layer where, you know, I don't care what the operating system is, I don't care what the hardware is underneath it, if I'm running on BEA WebLogic or IBM WebSphere, basically I can, you know, if I want to you know, switch from you know, a, a Windows box to Unix in the future, you know, or Linux later, sure, I can do that. So basically what we look at with things like Cloud Foundry are you know, a similar level of, of sort of insulation and isolation from you know, being sort of wedded you know, to proprietary features unique to any one of these platforms. Now, that being said, it's still incumbent on you to make smart choices in terms of the things that are around those platforms. So as an example, if I go with the Cloud Foundry on one of these platforms and then I sort of layer on top of that or alongside of that a whole bunch of proprietary features. You know, it might be uh, something like um, uh, Kinesis or something on, on Amazon or uh, you know, BigQuery you know, from Google or something you can only get from those providers. Then I've basically undone uh, a lot of the sort of platform independent um, work that I've tried to do with Cloud Foundry. So, yeah, it's a multi step process, it's not a simple process, but you know, frankly, the smart enterprises now are, you know, certainly embracing cloud, you know, because it offers so many advantages in terms of, uh, you know, being dynamic and provisioning of, um, or the speed of provisioning, but you have to think about sort of long term, how do I, you know, sort of make myself at least somewhat independent, you know, from any given provider. Well, so you brought up some of these tensions that are going on, but we've, we big big announcement also this week: Microsoft joining the, the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Yep. We've got Google Cloud here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Amazon. A lot of people also running on Amazon. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you've been following the the foundation and the ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, for a while. I mean, what do you what do you see in terms of the ecosystem? A lot of the big players mm -hmm. are not here this year, and, and kind of have, have ramped down their Cloud Foundry initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the health of the ecosystem, and where do you see it going? Um, those are good questions. I think, you know, the joining of Microsoft, I think, is a big one, all right? Um, you know, because Microsoft, you know, one of the conversations, for example, you have around the Azure platform is that Microsoft is in a lot of accounts. Um, and, you know, that has been a huge advantage for that platform really since the day it was born. Um, so I think that announcement was a good one, you know, for the overall health of the ecosystem. But, you know, I think, you know, sort of taking a step back in terms of, uh, you know, looking at Cloud Foundry and where it sits, honestly, I think the, you know, really the, the most accurate read from my standpoint, you know, goes back to, you know, one of the first or second questions that we talked about, which is, you just have different tools for different jobs, right? At the time that Cloud Foundry launched, right, you know, one of the things that was pretty much undeniably true was that if you're looking for uh, essentially PaaS platforms, you know, what we called PaaS at the time, you either had the choice of, uh, you know, essentially fixed uh, environments, you know, like a GAE, a, a Google App Engine, um, you know, Heroku, Force.com, you know, players like that, where they would take care of a lot of the heavy lifting for you, but you didn't have any control. Um, you don't really make any of the choices. So Cloud Foundry comes out and basically is, you know, for a while, at least the only game in town 
if you are thinking about sort of how you build a modern platform. Well, now we just have more options, right? In other words, you know, going back to what we were talking about with Kubernetes, you know, if I have a you know, sort of container-centric worldview, well, you know, I may want to go a different option or a different direction you know, than Cloud Foundry. But you know, honestly, I, I kind of liken it to uh, every year, for a number of years, I would go out to a conference called FOSDEM. It's in Brussels, it's a you know, huge open source conference. And I would talk to the Java developers there. And one of the things I would tell them was that you are never going to be as popular on a share basis as you once were. And they'd get very upset. Right? You know, a lot of people would be like, ah, I can't believe it, no, we're still everywhere, and there were all these projects and so on, and you'd say, you absolutely are. But, if we, again, if we you know, contrast where they were 10 years ago, where basically everything as we were talking about was either .NET or Java, to a world today where .NET and Java are still big properties and used in lots and lots of places, but you know, people want to use JavaScript, they might want to use Python, they might want to use Go, they might want to use all sorts of alternative languages, so, what does it mean? It means that in a marketplace where you have multiple choice, you know, each one of those players is probably going to you know, sort of have less attention um, and you know, less, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, overall visibility, uh, if you will, um, than if you're the only player in that market. So, I honestly don't read any more into it than that. You know, I think, you know, frankly, as we were talking about before, some measure of choice is good and you know, Frank, I think if you talk to a lot of people in the uh, Cloud Foundry community, they would probably tell you that, you know, hey, look, it's good to have uh, some choice. And, you know, the, you know, conversely, like, the people who are, you know, coming at it from a container standpoint, they probably don't want the only choice to be, you know, containers either. You know, we, we want options. I want to get your update on open source business models. Uh, okay. You kind of kind of look today, Pivotal is really an open core. Mm -hmm. Look at a lot of the cloud providers today are yeah. really delivering open source as a service. Yeah. Um, how open they are is debatable. Sure. Uh, one of the vendors uses a term called open cloud, which I've you know taken you know some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not saying I didn't yeah. necessarily uh, agree with it. So when mm -hmm. you, you look at like your, your book, The Software Paradox, mm -hmm. software is eating the world, open source is eating yep. money. Uh, do you think that's changed much? How do you how are you seeing the monetization of open source and privilege? Monetization, I think, from my standpoint, and a lot of people will not agree with me when I say this. The monetization, the future of monetization for open source, in my opinion, is largely going to be um, uh, in the cloud. You know, as a service, right? And it doesn't matter, like. Take a pick, whether it's a platform like a Cloud Foundry, whether it's a, a database like a Postgres or MySQL, like whatever it might be, that is the simplest, not to execute because it's challenging obviously to run a service, much more challenging than it is to just write and distribute software. Um, but in terms of the business model itself, it's the cleanest. Because you know, even the best open source companies, commercial open source companies in the world, convert a very, very small percentage of their users to actual paying customers. Um, and that's been a problem that everybody has tried to solve using various sort of you know, wonky, and at times awkward licensing mechanisms. You know, it used to be dual licensing with MySQL. Uh, the most common today is open core. Um, so you know, the, the question always has been, how do you get people to pay for something that's free? And the, you know, the answer is it's hard. You, know, you can work really hard at it, you can build a business, and commercial open source organizations are going to have a, you know, in my opinion, a long future but the real growth and the real opportunity is going to come from the people who don't just try to sell the software, but sell the software as a service. So instead of going to a business and saying, hey, do you want to buy this thing for me for free and then run it yourself, you go to them and say, do you want to buy this thing for me and by the way, I can run it better than you can because I wrote it. So, like I said, a lot of people in a lot of different areas, both analyst and uh, um, you know, people actually write software probably wouldn't agree with that, but Again, you know, doing what we do and having the conversations we have and looking at the numbers we do, that just seems the you know, clearest long-term projection from a model standpoint. I want to give you the final word, uh, other than of course watching your keynote, uh, for people that didn't make it to the show, any takeaways for them, uh, you know, updates to the communities, things that, that you'd share? Honestly, I think the biggest one for me is, is I think what we talked about at the top, right, which is um, the Cloud Foundry community in particular you know, has been uh, uh, very sort of op-centric historically, uh, you know, focused you know, largely on people who operate these platforms and run these platforms sort of at scale. Uh, and I think that um, both the conference here, uh, the foundation itself, the you know, a lot of people sort of in the Cloud Foundry orbit are thinking a lot more about, okay, you know, hey, the ops side here is really great, um, and that story is important to tell, but we also need to, to have a good story and a good narrative and a good message for the people who are actually using that platform to build software. So I think that's something that I'd, you know, whether you're here or not, you know, whether you go watch the talks, it's something I'd pay a lot of attention to.
Steve O'Grady, always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks Likewise. so much for joining us. For John and myself, we'll be back with more coverage here from the Cloud Foundry Summit here in Santa Clara. Thanks for watching theCUBE.